Um, so my name is Ed Curl, I'm uh, from The Corner, we are the under 18 substance misuse service uh, based in Sheffield. Um, so thanks for having me here today. So the purpose of today, we're going to talk through a little bit about our service, what we do, what we're here for and what we can offer you as professionals. Um, we're going to talk through our screening tool as well, which hopefully should be making its way around uh, so you should have a copy of that in front of you. Um, and shortly we're going to go through um, a bit of a scenario so we can look at the screening tool together and how you complete this in your practice. We're going to look at uh, vaping as well. So we're going to look at the context around vaping, where did it come from, how prevalent is it amongst young people, and different types of vapes, so nicotine vapes, THC, cannabis vapes, um, and sort of how to spot and identify these as well. And finally, we're going to wrap up by talking about synthetic cannabinoids, otherwise known as spice, and synthetic opioids, which are a growing problem at the moment in the UK. So, what do we offer? First of all, the sort of bread and butter of our work as a service, um, we do one-to-one -one brief and structured interventions with young people. We focus on promoting harm reduction around drug use. So we're not on an abstinence or a just say no service because we know from research that this approach just doesn't work and often has the opposite effect. So we look at promoting uh, education to help inform young people uh, around their own drug use. We offer consultation advice as well, so you can get in touch, email, phone, um, all of the classic means of communication, get in touch with us and we can offer some uh, general information around how to have these discussions. We also do group work, so we have an excellent outreach team. Uh, they visit youth clubs, schools, um, other support services and uh, do some brilliant work out in the community. We also have a family support service as well. So this is for parents of children who are using substances. We offer them advice uh, if they're struggling. And finally, we have um, a really, really great rolling free programme of training. Um, such as today, but we have uh, a range of topics that we cover that you can access. The final slide today will have a QR code so you can look at booking onto that as well. Everything's free, we have a mixture of in-person and online training, and we cover topics such as uh, current trends around drugs, uh, cannabis 101, uh, we have an in-depth screening tool training package as well, and basic drug awareness. Okay, right, I'm going to skip past the video, we might come back to it if we have time. Um, also, side note, if you have any questions, we have five, ten minutes for a Q&A at the end, so if you have any questions, uh, keep them in the bank. So, what do we do? Who are we as a service? We're young person focused, so this means we work with young people around their goals, their personal goals. We don't force abstinence, as I said before. <coughs> Client-led, confidential. Obviously very important, you all understand confidentiality, that's the very first thing we cover with a young person. And 10 to 18. If you have uh, anyone over the age of 18 who is experiencing issues with drugs and alcohol, the service for them would be Likewise, which are based in Shalesmore, they're the adult drug service. Um, and harm reduction focused, as I said before, that's the sort of central philosophy of what we do. This is our team, so broadly we're grouped into frontline resilience workers, such as myself. Um, we each have a lead specialism, a lead role. Um, we have an outreach team and some volunteers as well. So a bit of information on how to refer into our service. Firstly, you'll be very pleased to know we don't have a waiting list, unlike a lot of services. We take referrals from anyone Caveat to that is the young person must be aware of the referral and they must consent to the referral as well. So they must be on board. Um, the easiest way to make a referral to us is through our online portal and I'll put a QR code for that right at the end of this presentation as well. There's also like a downloadable PDF you can fill in as well. Um, so the online portal is the easiest way to do it, but you can also pick up the phone and speak to us as well. So once a referral goes through, they'll be allocated a frontline worker who will then contact the referrer and get the ball rolling. So hopefully by now everybody should have a copy of What's the Score, which is our um, screening tool that you can fill out. We'll also hopefully send this out to all of you so you've got a digital copy as well. 
So the purpose of this is to empower you as professionals to have these conversations with young people in your practice around substance use. It also helps us to clarify the level of risk and assign the appropriate level of support. So it's an open conversation, again, just with the referral process to us, the young person must be on board and consent to this screening tool taking place. So we'll take a look through the first section together. So if we look at questions one to six, um, this is sort of the, the quantitative part of the assessment. Um, we have three frequency options. So we've got regularly, occasionally, and never. Regularly is for more than two uses in the last 28 days. So if an under 18 says to you that they've been drinking alcohol every weekend regularly for several months, that would be a score of 10 on the screening tool. So it's score either 10, 5 or 0. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, so in this column here, what do you use? That would be um, where you input the type of substance that they've disclosed using. Each of these questions um, highlights a different uh, potential risk area and questions five and six, I just want to draw your attention to those um, in particular. Question number five relates to injecting use, which as I'm sure we're all aware, carries the highest level of risk due to the risk of overdose, um, needle injury and BPD. Question number six, in a similar fashion, um, relates to solvent abuse, which because of the risk of sudden sniffing death syndrome, there is no absolute harm reduction for this. So this would be particularly high risk and we would encourage um, direct contact with us um, to help manage that risk on an ongoing basis. So if they answer yes to questions five and six, um, we highly recommend the referral into us. The second section of the assessment um, is more qualitative and this is to look at the wider impact, so the holistic um, impact of substance use on a young person's life. And if you've had a little read through the questions, you'll probably have noticed that each of these maps quite nicely onto a specific risk area. So for example, if we look at question one, this relates to polysubstance use, so more, more than one substance at a time, which again carries a higher risk of overdose and unpredictable effects. Uh, question three, for example, looks at a person spending more money than they can afford on substances which could indicate potential drug debts or risk of exploitation. And the frequencies for these are the same as the previous part of the assessment. So it's important to think again about the follow-up questions for these. So we're not just asking the questions if they answer yes um, or disclose anything. Obviously be very delicate with it, but ask uh, follow-up questions. So the results fill in the score at the end of the screening tool. Um, if they scored 5 to 20, this would suggest maybe more experimentation, maybe slightly lower risk, um, so early intervention or preventative work, uh, maybe looking at positive activities um, would be most appropriate. If they scored 20 plus, this indicates a higher level of risk, so we would recommend a referral into the corner or at least contact with us. So now we're going to have a look at a, a scenario. So let's imagine Jack comes into the clinic and Jack is uh, disclosing his substance use with you. You've got the screening tool in front of you. Let's go through it right now. So I've already highlighted these or key points to pick up on in red um, just for time purposes. On the right hand side, we'll track through the questions that it would map onto as well. So Jack tells you that he smokes cannabis most days. So that would be regularly. Uh, has done for about four months. He's recently started smoking more than usual because he says he's feeling stressed out with stuff at school. So firstly we've got question number one, tick for regularly, and also he's now using to cope as a coping mechanism. He knows his mum is worried about his cannabis use because it's often causing arguments. She thinks Jack is hanging around with the wrong crowd and getting lazy. So we've got from this question six on part number two, um, realise your friend and or family are worried about your drug use, so that would be a tick in that box. Jack later mentions that last weekend he was at a friend's party, he explains that one of the lads there offered to split a pill, which would get him buzzing. Obviously we don't know what was in that pill, but we just put down pill. Despite being tipsy and already smoking cannabis earlier, Jack decided to try it out of curiosity. So now we've got a tick for pill occasionally, 
used more than one drug at a time because he was already drunk and smoking cannabis simultaneously. And he described how it felt. He said he was full of energy, he had a great time. However, he ended up kissing one of the girls there, which he regrets because he had a girlfriend. So, this now has shown from Jack that this has impacted his relationship and we've got a total score of 50 for Jack. So we would, off the back of this, encourage you to make a referral into the corner, obviously if Jack is on board and he consents to that. So next we're going to talk about a very controversial but very nuanced topic, which is vaping. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of vaping. There's so much that we could cover with this. Um, but I just wanted to cover some of the main points and what we're seeing at the moment as a service. So a little bit of background, technically not a vapour but an aerosol. They came into the market around 2003, um, invented by a Chinese pharmacist, um, and they were originally designed to be um, cigarette replacements. So the original ones on the market were cigarettes. They were uh, replicas of cigarettes that mimicked the, the hand-to-mouth action from smoking. The main two liquids that we find in vape liquid and disposable vapes are uh, propylene glycol and glycerin. Nicotine is then added, so this is artificial nicotine that's synthesised um, and any flavourings are then added as well. Probably seen out on the streets and in the shops, there's a ridiculous range of vape flavours uh, available, um, which the law may or may not change, we'll see how that goes. In terms of compliance, so what is illicit and what is legal. The MHRA needs to be aware of uh, any new vaping products. So this, this is relating to health warnings that must be visible on the label. There are also strict regulations around the nicotine content of these disposable vapes. So for a disposable, the maximum nicotine content should be 2% or uh, 20 milligrams per mil. And there was a 2021 report um, that took place that found that many of the vapes on the market, unsurprisingly, were unknown to the MHRA and completely over the legal limit of nicotine. Um, even more shockingly, we found that some of them contain some very dangerous chemicals. Um, fortunately, not a huge amount contain chemicals like lead and nickel. Um, but the main concern is that retailers are selling these to under 18s and that a huge number of them have an illicit um, amount of nicotine within them. Um, Trading Standards have also done lots of work as well where they've gone out to retailers and of 442 tests that have taken place, um, they found that a third of all retailers were willing to sell to under 18s. Um, and we can obviously you know, understand the financial incentives for this, um, but it's, it's a real problem. Um, and a quarter of those within that study were found to be non-compliant with UK standards. Another thing to note is uh, around the current research around smoking and vaping. We know now that vaping is thought to be around 95% safer than smoking tobacco. Um, however, it's important to know that vaping comes with its own set of problems and risks as well. One of those problems is the levels of nicotine. So as you can see here, bottom left is a typical crystal 600 puff disposable vape. Uh, and then a classic cigarette or straight on the bottom right. So I've already mentioned the sort of legal limit for nicotine. Um, so per 600 puff disposable vape, we're looking at approximately 40 milligrams of nicotine. So in a cigarette, there is on average around 12 milligrams of nicotine. However, only around a tenth of this is actually absorbed and um, taken into the body because a lot of the smoke is not inhaled. Um, so another thing to note is that we can't necessarily draw a direct comparison between the nicotine content in vapes and smoking because there's so many other factors at play such as the puffing patterns, the deepness of inhalation um, and several other things as well. Um, one thing to note, the difference between these is that a cigarette has a definitive start and an end point whereas a vape, until it runs out of battery or it runs out of e-liquid, it can just be consumed over and over and over, which has led to many concerns around young people and the amount of nicotine that they're using. So 
So what are the health implications of this? Um, very little is known about the long-term effects of vaping because they're so recently um, entered the market. However, we do know about the long-term health effects of smoking tobacco, um, and at the moment it's, it's pretty clear that vaping is a much safer alternative. So the short-term side effects are as follows, I'm not going to read those out for you, um, and we're seeing many young people, um, particularly within schools, um, having and experiencing these unfortunate side effects. Another thing to point out is regarding the harm of nicotine. Nicotine itself is not the problem and that's not where the harm comes. So nicotine is, is an addictive chemical, however the majority of the harm comes from the delivery device of that nicotine, whether it be tobacco or the e-liquid of a vape. Another thing that you know, ongoing research will shine more light on is um, the effect of nicotine and constant nicotine consumption on activating the dopamine pathways within the brain. So uh, particularly with the developing brain of teenagers, um, there are concerns around the impact on uh, regulating mood, concentration and alertness and potentially what the long-term effects of this could be on motivation as well. So some numbers and the prevalence. Um, what we're seeing as well does very much match up with this. So since 1996, the number of young people that um, have tried cigarettes has been steadily declining, which is a positive. Um, so it was from around 49%, um, and it's now down to around 12%. The number of young people that are vaping has increased annually, so data collection began in 2016 and there has been a 900% increase of regular young people vaping um, until 2023. And of these, around 20% of 11 to 17 year olds uh, have tried vapes. You might think that might be a low ball figure, which might be correct, um, there's obviously um, this is relying on reported data, so it could actually be higher than that. Uh, which is probably quite likely. And it's estimated that around 7.6% of young people use vapes uh, regularly. And this is in comparison to um, around 3.6% of 11 to 16 year olds who are smoking cigarettes. So young people, big picture, are smoking more, I'm sorry, vaping more than smoking cigarettes. Also, studies have found that girls are more likely to vape than boys. So the number of young women aged between 16 and 24, between 2021 and 2022, doubled. So we're seeing a large increase in the number of young women who are vaping. So here are a few different varieties of vapes and vape devices. Um, the very first one here is a typical 600 puff disposable vape. So these are a use once and then chuck it kind of device. They contain a small battery and a pre-filled tank with nicotine-based e-liquid. The next is a pod vape. So these are very similar, however, um, they're rechargeable and often have uh, interchangeable pods. So one way that retailers can get around the 600 puff limit is to have interchangeable cartridges, each with 600 puffs, that can then be swapped, so it comes as a pack of four that actually turns it into a 2004-inch puff vape. The next type we're seeing, um, which is less common now, but these were the very first ones on the market, these are the cigar-likes, um, so they're meant to mimic cigarettes, often in flavour as well as appearance. Next we have refillable vapes, um, sometimes called mods. Um, these are tank-based vapes that often have lots of settings where people can change the amount of vapour and cloud that comes from them. Um, and lots and lots of varieties of pods um, and e-liquids that can be added to those. The next type is a form of cannabis vape, and these are called dry herb vaporizers. So herbal cannabis is added into a tank, which is then heated up and vaporized, as opposed to traditionally smoking cannabis in a joint, for example. Um, you know, these are significantly safer and less harmful to the lungs than uh, smoking cannabis and these are probably the safest form of uh, cannabis vape. The next type of cannabis vape we're looking at and seeing quite a lot of are THC vapes. So I'm going to come on to these a little bit more in the next few slides, um, but there's several different varieties of THC vape, one of which is a pre-packaged um, vape like this one in the picture. These are often called Cali pens, 
um, which are named from wheat that's grown in California, which in the UK often isn't real California wheat. Um, so we're seeing quite an increase in young people that are using THC vapes, um, and they are particularly high risk for several reasons that I'm going to come on to now. So as I say, we've seen a steady increase in young people that are using THC. They may refer to it as tea um, or THC e-liquid. We're finding that many of these THC liquids actually do not contain real THC, or they may only contain a small amount of THC in addition to spice, um, also known as synthetic cannabinoids. And young people are falsely <coughs> believing that these are just very strong cannabis vapes without realizing what the true effects of spice <coughs> is. And sadly, many young people have been hospitalized as a result of this use. So generally speaking, young people have a very negative impression of spice. It's generally been thought of as a prison drug, and it's very popular amongst the homeless communities. Um, and many users, often polysubstance dependent users who have been using it for a long time, will say that spice is the worst drug that they have ever had. And it's having a serious ripple effect on, um, on the world, particularly in the UK. So only a small amount of spice or synthetic cannabinoids is needed to produce these um, very scary and dangerous effects. So what's actually inside these vapes? So these four images on the right are screenshots from a website called Wedenos, and that is a Welsh drug testing identification service. Um, they do some amazing work. So people send in samples of drugs, street drugs, that are then analysed in their labs. Uh, and they post on their website the results from these. So all four of these bottles of e-liquid uh, were purchased with the intent of it being THC, which um, I realise I've not actually mentioned what THC is. For those who are unfamiliar, THC is the primary chemical that's found within cannabis, um, and it's yeah extremely psychoactive. So the top. The top two and the bottom left all contained spice or different forms of synthetic cannabinoids and no THC at all. So, and these are not exceptions at all. These are very, very um, increasingly being seen amongst THC liquids. The bottom right one actually does contain THC, so this would be a legitimate uh, e-liquid. Also contains uh, CBN and CBD, which are the chemicals naturally found within cannabis. So what dealers will typically do when they are selling these bottles of THC to young people, as you can see on the left, they may fill a majority of it with a nicotine e-liquid. They may fill the rest with um, synthetic cannabinoids or spice as a liquid dissolved in solvent. And then they may put a small amount of actual real THC liquid into there as well. And the reason they do this is so that they can um, have a test at home that says yes, this is confirmed to be real THC. They will then advertise that to their prospective customers um, without disclosing that it also contains a lot of spice. So there was a study recently done by the University of Bath in conjunction with CGL, which is our parent company at the corner. Um, so they, they've analysed some samples from 38 UK schools and they found that one in six of these actually contains spice. So this is a very um, unsettling statistic, and we're seeing this quite a lot in UK schools at the moment. It's really important to be aware of this and what the risks are around spice. So of these samples that were tested, only 1.6 of these contain real THC, which just completely flies in the face of the purchase intent for many of these drugs. The pie chart on the left shows of the vapes that did contain synthetic cannabinoids, um, or SCRAs, which are synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists, um, these were the colours of the liquid that were you know, found in the sample. So there's a broad range of how it looks, and this just also highlights that there's no way for a professional or a young person to tell what the liquid contains just based off its appearance. The chart on the right shows the type of de uh, device uh, for those that contain spice.
So synthetic cannabinoids um, over 100 compounds that can fall under the umbrella term of this. They are essentially um, synthetic substances, you know, as you can tell by the name, um, often produced and manufactured in laboratories. The majority of the world's synthetic cannabinoids come from China in labs, um, and they, they're designed to mimic the effects of cannabis in the body. However, it's an extremely different drug with a very different profile of risk. The very first SCRAs came into the market in 2007, and the street name for them was Spice, and that name has stuck. Um, but there are many, many different types, di different generations, and different uh, varieties of Spice. So it's evolved over the years. I think we're on around the seventh generation, uh, and each of these has a different profile of, of risks and effects, and the potency can vary massively. So here are some of the psychological effects of synthetic cannabinoids. I'm not going to read these out for you. And these can crop up after only a small amount of the drug. So some of the risks of these substances, um, risk of physical and psychological dependence. Um, it's very different to cannabis. Users who have been using scrolls for a while say that trying to get off them is similar to withdrawing from strong opiates. There's a risk of fatal overdose, um, so they can cause seizures and also um, cause cardiac arrests, again from a small amount of ingestion. Risk of acute psychotic episodes, long-lasting amnesia. This is often a sought-after effect for many um, street users, um, so they often will report that using spice over the period of a year actually just felt like a month. And potential PTSD and flashbacks as well. So as a professional, how do we respond to a suspected spice or opiate overdose? And I'm going to touch a little bit on some synthetic opiates shortly. Um, you might be familiar with the picture. This is a nasal spray naloxone called Nixoid. Um, so treat the symptoms, not the substance. Some of the symptoms include seizures, overheating and sweating. So 909 and administer naloxone. So I mentioned synthetic opioids. What we are seeing in the UK is unfortunately the spread of highly potent synthetic opioids called nitazines. And just as with spice, there are several versions of nitazines. Um, but all of these are very, very powerful synthetic opioids. Um, I'm sure many of you will be much more familiar with them than myself. Um, but yeah, we're seeing that some nitazines are up to 100 times stronger than oral morphine. Many nasal naloxone sprays, so the Nixoid from the previous slide, many of the Nixoid sprays are rendered ineffective by nitazines just because of how powerful and how potent they are as a drug. Um, but obviously, Better be on the safe side and administer it anyway. So nitazines have made their way into many illicit street drugs in the UK. You may have heard of fentanyl. Fentanyl is very similar to nitazines, but we're seeing a lot more of fentanyl in the US, whereas in the UK we're seeing more nitazines um, for whatever reason. We're finding nitazines crop up in, of course, the heroin supply. Um, but also in other street drugs and pills and powders such as benzodiazepines, cocaine and the THC vapes as well. Um, and we're also seeing xylazine show up as well in some THC vapes. And this could be deliberate, so it could be intentional for financial purposes uh, because they're a lot cheaper than other substances. Dealers might dilute their drug supply with nitazines or it could be due to accidental cross-contamination as well. And next I'm just going to show a, a visual comparison, you may have seen this photo before, just comparing the lethal dose for heroin, fentanyl and carfentanyl. Um, in this image the fentanyl would be very similar in potency to many nitazines. So this is the fatal dose comparison, as you can tell. Um, carfentanyl is an extremely potent, it's one of the most potent um, synthetic opioids available and it's used as a tranquilizer for large animals in veterinary medicine, 
so elephants and rhinos, um, so very, very powerful. I'm now going to show a uh, slide. This is our training, um, training role, basically. These are our upcoming dates for our training. It's fantastic, so get yourself booked onto it. If you want to scan the QR code, this will take you to um, this list, and then you can send an email and book onto this training. It's all free. I appreciate you busy. We also offer some bespoke training as well, so we can come to you uh, and deliver it to a group um, in a setting similar to this today. And finally, this will take you to our referral page on our website, and obviously we've got our contact information here as well. Um, let me know if you have any questions at all. Thank you.